Hi, this is the voice, Michael Chavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Oddscast, presented by Five Dives. I'm Brian Hemminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts line setter Nick Kalikas and fight scientist Reed Kuhn to break down this weekend's UFC event, which is the Ultimate Fighter China finale taking place Saturday morning in Macau, China. If you're unfamiliar with our format, myself and Nick will be breaking down this fight card from top to bottom, giving a profile and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Reed will be stepping in and offering his expansive numerical insight on all fights with sufficient data. For this event, however, Reed will only be able to contribute on four of the main card bouts. Briefly looking back at the last event, our premium bets for UFC 170 went 1 and 2 for a 1.7 unit loss overall. We hit a parlay on the totals of the overs for the Davis Eye and Asuncao Munoz fights. But our straight bets on the big underdogs, Damian Maya and Pedro Munoz, failed to hit. Our free play, a two-unit bet on Zach Makovsky paired with Aljamain Sterling, did hit, but we only count the premium plays towards our official track record. Now back to the present, the Ultimate Fighter China finale features a nine-fight card in total and will be aired on the UFC Fight Pass network. Let's dive right in. Now, kicking off the card is a featherweight matchup between a pair of UFC debuters in Juma Becky Tourgen, who is 14-0, and taking on Mark Ediva, who is 5-0. and Now, Nick, where'd you open this fight, and how has public shifted things so far? Opening line, Tourgen, minus 230, the comeback on Ediva, plus 170. Early support coming in on Torsion at five dimes. Right now he's minus 245. So not a ton of support, but again, people going that route in uh, a diva's way. Not really surprised. There's been a lot of buzz and a lot of, um, you know, hype behind Torsion for a little while now. He's supposed to be a very talented guy. Former UFC, or I'm sorry, Legend FC, not UFC obviously, but former Legend FC champion. Um, you know, again, there's been some buzz, some hype around him. More so than a diva for sure, but getting into the type of fighter torsion is, honestly, looking over some film and footage and all my research I did with him, I was unimpressed. I mean, I was expecting a lot more from him. His striking is okay. Um, he does have decent technique at times, but to me it seems like he lacks a little bit of confidence, um, which is not really what you want to see in a, a future prospect. Um, but his ground game is really his best attribute. He's got solid grappling, decent ground and pound, decent takedowns, and control in most cases to go along with the okay submission game. But just nothing too extraordinary. I mean, again, I was a little disappointed after the research. I just think he's a little bit overrated and a little bit overhyped. That being said, he should still have some advantages over Adiva. I think Adiva is obviously, well, for those that don't know, he's also a grappling-based fighter. Um, he's a former URCC champion. So, again, on the smaller shows against lower-level competition, both of these guys have strived and have gotten recognition and actually gained championships on that level. But they're not – I don't think they're either one of these guys are really UFC-level or UFC-caliber fighters. Um, it is going to be a competitive matchup and getting into a diva a little bit. He tends to be a little bit more aggressive than torsion on the feet. He's just not as technical. Um, defensively, both these guys are concerned. They get tagged a lot, but a little bit more so with a diva. Um, but he does show a good chin and, and some heart. I mean, he got plastered. If you go look back at his last fight, I believe the guy's gentleman's name was Lee. He took some abuse um, via knees. I mean, just brutalized. Um, but his chin hung in there. He had heart enough to actually hang on and take the fight to the ground, Does did what he does best, and actually finished the fight by sus. So a diva, that kind of showed me that he he's in it to win it. I mean, the guy definitely has heart, and that might not get him by enough in this spot here. It's going to be competitive. I think it, it's actually more competitive than the line indicates right now. I think it should be just barely under 2-1, to one, but this is the type of fight and the type of situation where you really can't recommend dog or pass or – even a favorite bet in this spot, honestly. So I think it's just pass altogether, see how these guys do in their UFC debut, and we'll go from there. But I do slightly lean torsion, but again, it's it's one of these spots that I think is going to be very competitive. He is moving up to 145. He usually fights at 135, and the Diva is a standard 145 fighter in most cases. So 
I think it's going to be competitive, but I do lean slightly towards torsion. Yeah, and you know, and looking at this fight, honestly, both guys are are okay, but I, I like torsion better. Even though Torsion normally fights at 135 and he's moving up to, to 145 for this, I'm not exactly sure why. I hope he drops back to 135 afterwards. But uh, overall, Torsion is a, a pretty decent wrestler. He normally prefers to fight on the ground, has a, a pretty extensive Sando background. He's a bit of a grinder, not a big finisher. So a lot of fights will go to decision, so you know his cardio is pretty solid. And uh, yeah, it, it's been about a year since he last fought as well, so... Looking at him, he's he's a pretty good athlete. He relies on top control when he gets fights to the ground. Occasionally, he'll get uh, a submission, but you know he's not really a strong submission grappler because you know he's facing guys that aren't really that good of grapplers themselves, and he's not getting a lot of finishes. So that is a little concerning. On the feet, he's not very aggressive. He likes to move backwards. He gets pressured, but you know he does have some a little bit of surprising power. So hopefully, if uh, Adidas coming in way too aggressively like he has done before, then maybe Torsion can, can clip him because he has scored some decent knockout in the past. Now, Adiva, this guy scares me because, in a bad way, in my opinion, he trains out of Team K, which has a couple guys that you might have heard of in the 1FC or uh, even uh, that David Galera guy who made his UFC debut against Singapore and lost uh, to Royston Wee, Royston Wee. But uh, Team K hasn't had the most success as of lately and honestly I, I don't think it's that good of a gym and it scares me that he's the ground specialist out of that team when those guys have like no ground game whatsoever almost so that is concerning to me I think uh it's it's been three years since his last fight as well that's terrifying and he's only fought once in the last five years almost like, honestly, Torshin has almost fought his entire 14-fight on-record career in the, in the span that Adiva has fought his last two fights. So, like, that is huge to me. And, uh, and of the guys that Adiva's fought, the last four are combined 0-7 in their career. So 0-2, 0-2, 0-2, and then he faced a kickboxer who has only ever fought once, and he's 0-1. So, I mean, honestly, like Adiva's track record, the, the, the competition, the, the lack of fighting, it, like, how could you possibly pick this guy to win? And, and even when he does fight, I, I don't think he looks that good. Um, he left huge openings in his last fight, which was three years ago, I might add. I must continue hyping on that. And, he looked very hittable. He does not transition well when he's going for takedowns. He gets just eats big shots. So I think uh, Torshin not only beats him, but probably uh, – he probably won't get a finish, but he should easily beat him. And even on the ground, Torshin should probably win the exchanges and uh, get on top because that, that's what he does best. So my pick's Torshin. Uh, relatively confident, but I, don't, I doubt I'm betting it. So moving on, we have a fight. This one's, if we thought the last one was bad, um, we have Albert Chang, who is two and three overall in the welterweight division, taking on Wang Anying, who is one and one overall. So Nick, where'd you open this one earlier today? Well, again, I'm going to butcher some of these names bad, but um, I open up Wang minus 140 to come back on Chang, even money. So the line did flip, though. I mean, looking at uh, five dimes at the time of the recording, the current line was actually on Wang in Wang's favor again, actually minus 130. But it flipped, and Chang became the slight favorite. So it's pick 'em, and it's getting two-way action back and forth um, in the line. It is kind of one of those type of spots because honestly, neither one of these guys belong in the UFC or making their debuts. I mean, both these guys are really bad, as Brian said. I mean, we were talking about the last fight. I was unimpressed with those guys. Holy cow! I mean, these guys are tough China veterans, obviously. That's why they're on this card, um, semifinalists, and they're doing battle here. But, man, there's not really an upside to either one of these guys. I don't expect to see them remain in the UFC, on the UFC roster long. I know they're building up the region over there. They're trying to have some draws and get some popular fighters or whatever. But, yeah, like I said, I don't think these guys are going to eventually make the cut. But there is a bigger upside on Wang, I think, in this spot. He has a little bit more potential. I think he's got the better striking. Um, and for limited experience, I mean, he actually 
shows flashes of, you know, well, I don't want to say greatness, but flashes of decent striking. I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, he's patient but aggressive, if that makes sense too. And he's got pretty clean technique with some power. So that's what's kind of leaning more towards Wang in this spot. It's basically your typical grappler versus striker matchup. And Chang is coming in as the grappler here. So Wang is the striker. Um, I don't know. It's going to really depend if he can keep it up and off his back, obviously, because Chang will have um, the ground advantage and the submission advantage there as well. But I still think that more times than not, Wang will probably do enough to keep it up, and I think he's going to do more damage um, when it comes to landing on Chang. Now, I should get into Chang a little bit here. He's not very technical on the feet. He's more of a brawling. He has more of a brawling style. Um, he does have some power, but he tends to get a little bit wild. His grappling is also his best attribute, like I just said. Well, I mean, his main attribute here, unlike uh, Wang's. And his ground game, it's okay. I mean, he does go for takedowns very often. Um, he likes to clinch up against the fence and kind of, like, slow the pace of the fight down that way. So that kind of gets him some points, I think, on the cards as well. Um, he's just one of these grinders that isn't very impressive at all. Um He's, he, again, he's got heart, but he's just not that good. So it's hard for me to have any faith in Chang because I do think Wang has a little bit more of an upside to him, like I said, and I think he's probably going to get the win here. Again, you can't be confident in these guys as they don't really even belong in the UFC, but I think eventually Wang's going to find a way to win this fight if, if it's by stoppage or a competitive decision. So I'm going to go that way. Yeah, and this is, again, a bit of a laugher. Both of these guys competed on the Ultimate Fighter China, and that season was not very good talent-wise, especially at welterweight, where these guys competed. They actually both were in the semifinals, and they didn't actually earn their way to the semifinals, to be honest. Um, Chang lost his quarterfinal fight. He got TKO'd in the second round uh, after gassing, and then uh, Wang actually got a free pass to the semifinals because his opponent didn't make weight and nobody else could make weight in time to face him. So it was just awful all around. How And uh, Chang ended up getting to the semifinals because the guy that beat him was hurt and then he faced a, re a replacement and the guy tapped out when Chang mounted him. So after no real damage. So just getting that out there, like just uh, just to showcase the the level of competition that these guys are are in there with, and so Chang was one and two on the show, and he has a two and three record, and Wang ended up getting a free pass to the semis, and then he got tapped out in the semis uh, against one of the finalists here. So neither of these guys, in my opinion, are very good. Uh, Wang, he's he's younger, he's twenty two, he's. A little tentative when he's worried about the takedown, but overall he he's not a bad striker. He uses low kicks from range. He incorporates feints. Like he has decent enough technique, but I think he gets a little lost when he's on the ground. He does not have that good a takedown defense, and he has pretty poor sub defense and scrambling ability. So if this fight goes to the ground, Chang should be able to, to control him and, and advance position and threaten with submissions and ground and pound. And uh, Chang's a unique character, 29 years old. He actually lives and trains out of Canada. So he's his parents were Chinese. So he's not even that good of a, a Chinese speaker. They brought him over basically as a ringer, even though he's only two and three overall. And he's a strength and conditioning coach. Like he's not a full-time fighter doesn't have very good conditioning, does not have much to fall back on if he does not get the takedown. So a lot of things really concerned here. He does look for the takedown. He's kind of smothering from top position, but he doesn't do a whole lot from there either. So he doesn't threaten with a lot of finishes when you don't have a lot of finishing ability and you have poor cardio. That is a concern. And while his stand-up is not great, he does kind of explode forward with a lead hook, so occasionally he could get a little tricky, but he gets frustrated very easily, and if he gets put in a bad spot, he kind of gives up. So that is also a concern, but considering how both of these guys are just not very good, I'm, I'm going to go with the better grappler because that usually is how things work. So I, I'm picking Chang, zero confidence, zero bet. You'd have to be crazy. Uh, but, yeah, my pick's Chang. <laughs> So moving on, we have another 170-pound contest. This one's actually between some experienced fighters. We have uh, Zach Cummings, a veteran of the Ultimate Fighter, uh, season 18, I believe. He is 16 and 3 overall, 
taking on Alberto Mina, who is 10 and 0. So, Nick, where'd you open this fight, and how's public shifted things so far? Well, I opened Zach Cummings, minus 165. The comeback on Mina was plus 125, and actually a little bit of support coming in on the dog early on. I wasn't sure which way the public would take this fight, but um, it's going to be pretty competitive, and I'm sure the sports are going to get two-way action. So a little bit of a lean towards Cummings on my opener, but the public and the general action has dropped the line. Right now, Cummings is down to minus 135, so he's still a slight favorite. Um but it's an interesting spot. I mean, definitely, there's no doubt about it. I mean, Cummings is going to be Amina's best opponent to date. He hasn't fought anybody as capable or as complete as Cummings. But I'll start off with Mina right away. A lot of people probably don't know much about him. Um, he's a BJJ and a judo black belt. So the guy is very versed on the ground in the grappling arts. Um, he's a top prospect to many. I mean, a lot of people have had Mina on, his, on their radar for a long time. Um, he, especially early on in his career, he lacked a little bit in the striking department, but through progression and through hard work, I mean, you could really see him coming on and, and really taking to the striking a lot more as his game, overall game has progressed as well. So really, he's a little bit more than your typical grappler at this point. Still, he's developing his striking game, always improving. Um, he does on the feet move okay, and he likes to throw kicks and knees from the clinch. Um, he's got some brutal knees actually from the clinch, which is pretty impressive, but definitely, Grappling is Mina's best attribute. Um, he has a good ground game. He has good timing on his takedowns. He's got these sneaky leg trips from the inside um, and some solid ground and pound to go along with it. And he does tend to stay busy, look for uh, position, and look for that submission. So he's pretty smooth on the ground. He's good fight IQ. And there's, I think, some decent upside to him. I mean, he's actually, I mean, not a young prospect at age 31, but still, I mean, I expect some good things out of him, uh, definitely in the 170 pound division. That being said, again, he's facing by far, I think, his stiffest test of date in Cummings. I mean, Cummings is one of these guys that have been fl- floating around for a long time under the radar. Um, he's fought a lot of fights in middleweight, even, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, hired sometimes. Um, but Cummings has never lost at 170. Um, so he's, Overall, his record 16 and 3, and he's undefeated in welterweight. I mean, the guy has a lot of experience, um, a lot of decent wins on his resume as well, and he continues to really improve and get better. And I think he's finally like hitting a groove, getting that confidence. And his best attribute is also his ground game, but he mixes things up decent on the feet. So he's a very complete, talented fighter, a savvy vet, um, and there's a lot of big uh, upside to Cummings as well. And he's no easy out, especially facing him in your UFC debut. So I'm leaning slightly towards Cummings because I think he's a more complete fighter at this stage. But, man, this is going to be a barn burner, another very competitive fight. I could see a split decision type of outcome here in this spot. Or I could see Cummings maybe possibly being a little bit too far ahead for Mina right now. So I'm going to go that route and pick Cummings in a very, again, competitive uh, probably decision. Or if there is a stoppage here, I'll be a little surprised because I think they're going to neutralize each other out. Um, but that could happen as well because both these guys are so dangerous on the ground. But I'm leaning that way, but expecting Mina to have a decent debut, and I'm expecting some good things from Mina, unlike some of the other guys that we were just talking about on this card. Yeah, and, and I, I actually disagree a little bit in terms of how good Mina's going to look here. Like, he was a really good prospect. He was on the, the bloody elbow top prospect list. People were hyping him up. But that was 2010. That was so long ago, back when he was still fighting actively. You know, back when he was a guy that was tearing up the Brazilian scene. And since then, he has just been off the radar. He he went out to England and basically just helped train fighters for a while. He wasn't really doing anything. He stopped fighting. Um, he's only fought twice in over four years now. Uh, he did have a, a good performance recently in December. Like, again, that was two months ago, less than that. And, and it was a solid showing, but that, that's scary to me that he didn't fight for over two years. He finally fought, uh, and then he's fighting again in two months. Like, what's the turnaround going to be like for Mina, uh, especially at 31 years old making his UFC debut? And worst of all to me is, after tr- going to England, which is probably going to reduce his skills from being in Brazil, he's now training out of Hong Kong. Like, wh- what type of training is he going to get over there? Um, so I, I have to question that. So he may be a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, but, you know, I don't know what kind of iron sharpening iron situation he's in right now in terms of training. And he is slick on the ground, but, yeah, the the time off scares scares the daylights out of me. And... In terms of Cummings, I think Cummings is really solid. 
He's uh, only 29 years old. He's a really big welterweight. I mean, the guy's been competitive, competitive fighting at light heavyweight even when he fought for the the light heavyweight title. Uh, he's he's battled some really solid people like um, Tim Kennedy at 185 pounds. Like he's been in there against some solid people. He he had a decent showing on the Ultimate Fighter, and then his UFC debut, he looked fantastic. Got a really quick submission in the first round. So I think the guy's really sharp. He's a scrap type of fighter on the feet. If he keeps it standing, he should be able to outwork Mina. And on the ground, I think he's going to hold his own, and he probably is the better wrestler. So as long as he doesn't make any big mistakes and leave openings for submissions, which I don't think Mina can capitalize on at this point, I think Cummings could outwork him on the ground, and I think Cummings is going to outwork him on the feet. So uh, I I actually like Cummings here pretty well. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's one of my favorite guys, so I, I definitely like Cummings. So moving on, we have another interesting battle here between uh, a UFC vet and a debuter. We have uh, Kazuki Tukadomi, who is 12-4-1 uh, overall in the lightweight division, taking on the Korean bulldozer, Yui Chul Nam, who is 17, 4, and 1. So, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Well, interesting one here. Um, Nam, even though he's making his debut, I opened a minus 180 over Tokodumi and the comeback plus 140 on him. So, coming in as a slight favorite line, actually, Staying steady, holding steady there. I'm sure the books are getting two-way action with it early on, or a lot of people are just hesitating to bet this fight, period. Um, that being said, it's a pretty interesting fight because, again, you have two guys that do have an upside and are very talented um, in several ways. So I, I'm expecting a very competitive matchup, but make no mistake about it, Nam is favored for a reason. I do think he's got some advantages in this spot. Have respect for Tokudumi's game, no doubt about it. Um, but getting it to Nam first, I mean, his striking, he's one of these aggressive, powerful strikers. He's got really heavy hands, but I'm power in both hands. He's the type of guy that uh, can club you with either hand and rock you, get you some trouble. He does tend to get a little wild at times as well, but he does have a pretty decent fight IQ. Now, looking at his track record also, along the way, you can see he's got some solid wins. I mean, he's been in the, with decent competition outside of the UFC. So that's impressive. You know he's been tested at least against, again, solid competition. So, I mean, that goes a long way. He's not going to be out of his realm and get a veteran like Tokodumi. I think it's going to be, again, a, a very competitive fight. But I think the biggest part about Nam's game is he, he can control or at least be a little bit more aggressive on the feet. Um he has the opportunity to land and Tokudumi, if there's any, I think, flaws in his game, it's defensively on the feet. I mean, he gets tagged way too much, um, for my liking. He does have good boxing though. Offensively, I mean, Tokudumi actually is fun to watch because he puts up, he puts together his combinations very clean. He has good striking offensively again. Um, he uses his kicks. He uses, utilizes everything pretty well. Um, but, he does leave openings, he does get tagged, and he's been rocked and knocked out before in the past. So against a guy with that much power in Nam, not a good sign. I mean, you want to try to avoid the spot um, if you're betting on Sokodumi, I would think. That being said, the grappling aspect is going to be close. I think Tokodumi is probably going to struggle getting Nam to the floor, where Nam's probably going to maintain top control a little bit more so. But I do see some scrambles and some possible spots where it's competitive. And it might go back and forth on the ground because Kodumi does have some solid takedown defense. He has some decent reversals. And he's got a good top game. I mean, good ground and pound. And he does definitely have the ground advantage, pure ground advantage over Nam, I think, um, overall. It might not be significant, but it's enough there to, to be something at least. So I do lean with Nam. I think he's going to win this fight. Uh, he's going to make a successful UFC debut because he has more ways to win it. Again, I think he could win on the cards. I think he could possibly clip Tokudumi's chin, put him out that way, or he could just grind him out a decision as well. So I do like Nam to win this fight. Tokudumi is going to be a game, and it should be a good fight. So another spot where, unlike the previous early fights, uh, this should be a good one. Yeah, and, and I completely agree in terms of uh, Nam. I, I really like him. You know, watching his highlight videos, watching his fights, he's uh, one of the more entertaining UFC debuters on the entire card, probably the most entertaining He's extremely, extremely aggressive. They call him the Korean bulldozer because 
He is constantly putting on pressure, moving forward, uh, watching him fight. He is very intimidating with his stare down. He has this presence about him. He throws some vicious knees when he's up close. He throws a mean left hook. He's constantly throwing combinations and looking to swarm his opponents. He's just very entertaining. He's super, super aggressive. And he has pretty good power. He scored quite a few uh, stoppage victories. So even though most recently he's had some decision wins, uh, the guy's a finisher. He's very, very fun to watch. And uh, he mixes it up. So if, if things aren't going well on the feet, although they should, because uh, Tokadumi is nothing that special on the feet, uh, he can shoot in for takedowns. Now, he doesn't do a whole lot with the takedowns other than occasionally uh, get a submission or occasionally get a TKO victory on the ground. But most of the time, this guy just wants to pummel people on the feet, and he's very good at it. And Tukadume is, you know, he's only 26 years old, and he's solid, but he's just unspectacular in pretty much all the areas. He's got a pretty good clinch, but he's better defensively than offensively. So more often than not, you'll see him uh, take guys down and just not get submitted and, and get the points and do things like that. And that's not going to work here against Nam. I mean, uh, Tokadumi has decent power, okay takedowns in boxing, but he gets outworked by more aggressive fighters, and you're not going to find a more aggressive fighter than uh, the Korean bulldozer here on this entire card. So I'm really worried here about Tokadumi getting just uh, overwhelmed. And uh, Tokadumi does have decent top control and a little bit of power in his right hook, but, you know, he hurt Cristiano Marcelo, and I don't know if you can even count that because Marcelo's 37 years old and doesn't have a very good chin. So I think uh, this is Nam's fight to lose. Like, as long as he doesn't uh, completely expose himself to a super easy takedown because he's too aggressive or doesn't leave a huge opening for a counter shot and walk right into something. Uh, Nam's either going to outwork Tokadumi for a decision or he could knock him out. I could definitely see Nam getting the finish here. So uh, my pick is definitely Yui Chul Nam. Now, the first bout of the Tough China finale main card is a featherweight contest featuring Hatsu Hiyoki, who is 26-7-2 overall, taking on Ivan, the pride of El Salvador, Menjivar, moving up to featherweight. He is 25-11 overall. Now, Nick, where'd you open this fight, and what's the public said so far? Well, I open Hayoki, the decent favorite, minus 350, the comeback on Menjivar, plus 250. Early action did come in on Hayoki. The line is up to minus 380 right now, uh, plus 260 on Menjivar at five dimes. Now, I should make a little side note here. The lines were just recently um, released, so all of the lines are fresh, and there's going to be some, uh, I guess, early movement, so you might want to check five dimes.eu for updates here. But right now, at the time of the recording, Hayoki did get bumped up to minus 380. As far as matchups go, this is a great fight because both guys are veterans of the sport. They've been around for a long time, and both of these guys are very complete MMA fighters. So should be a fun one. As far as the line goes, though, and why it's so steep, I mean, Hayoki has several advantages in this fight. First of all, Menjivar is moving back up to uh, 145 to take this fight. I mean, in the past, he did make weight at 135, but it's noticeable that he kind of struggled to make that weight class. He hasn't had as much success recently in the weight class, so I think he's going to kind of – Bump back up to 145, give himself a little break as far as the weight cut goes and see how he performs here. Unfortunately for him, Hayoki again is just going to be, I think, a little a bit better in every area. I mean, if it goes to the ground, both these guys have tremendous grappling, but I think Hayoki is going to get the top position. And I would think the submission game kind of neutralizes each other out. If anybody gets a sub between them, I have to give the slight advantage again to Hayoki because I think he could possibly take Menjivar's back. Menjivar has been subbed before where Hayoki has not. So slight lean on the ground towards Hayoki. He should get top position. If it does hit the floor, his wrestling, I think, is a little bit better than Menjivar's. On the feet, it should be close, but Hayoki, again, has some advantages there. He's got the obvious reach advantage, and that, with his kicking game mixed in, is going to make it tough for Menjivar to close the gap and get inside. So Hayoki should have a slight edge on the feet and should have the slight edge on the ground. I think he's going to win a clear-cut decision here. Um, so that's why you're seeing the line so hard, so high, I should say, and that's why I'm going to pick Hayoki to win too. It's a tough one to bet at the current price, but Hayoki should still be the side. Yeah, and I have to completely agree with you here. Hiyoki did come into UFC with a lot of hype, but obviously that has 
curtailed a little bit after the three fight losing streak. All three fights incredibly close though. And he is two and three overall in the UFC. But with Menchivar coming up to featherweight, he is at a massive size disadvantage here. Uh, Hioki's much longer, much taller. And honestly, when Hioki fights closer to Japan, he looks amazing. When he fought in Japan against Bart Palaszewski, that was the best he's ever looked inside the octagon. I think fighting in Macau, he'll be, you know, just as solid here. So, you know, that's definitely something to look for. Hioki is a pretty solid overall striker. Nothing spectacular, but he puts up, uh, you know, he uses his reach relatively well. He has a little bit of sneaky power and his jabs are pretty sharp. The, the big problem with him has been inactivity, a little bit of hesitancy. He really hasn't gone for it a lot in the UFC. And, you know, more aggressive, resilient fighters have taken advantage of that. But I'm not sure that Menjavar has the overall skill set and the size and maybe even the cardio to do that. Because, you know, obviously we talked about Menjavar being smaller, but, you know, he is an unorthodox striker. He uses a lot of spinning attacks. He actually has some really good elbows if he gets inside. But is he going to be able to get inside against Hiyogi? That's a problem. And again, Menjavar is solid on the ground, but he's not better than Hiyoki on the ground. Uh, Hiyoki is one of the better ground fighters overall in the UFC featherweight division, in my opinion. You know, when he gets people on the canvas, he passes guard very well. He has a really nasty mount. He has a whole bunch of little tricks that he's developed over the years. Very uh, crafty veteran on the ground. And I just don't see Menjavar being able to hang with him there. So if it goes to the ground, I give the advantage to Hioki. And on the feet, unless Menjavar turns this into a big brawl, Hioki should be able to outpoint him on the feet too. So there's just not a whole lot of ways for Hio- or for Menjavar to win this unless he just goes balls to the wall and just goes crazy. But, you know, he's shown a bit of a lack of action in recent fights and, and that's cost him. So, you know, we saw Wilson Hayes able to take him down repeatedly in his last fight. So, you know, even if he does come forward aggressively. Hiyoki might be able to just, you know, change levels, trip and take him down because that leaves him open. So my pick is definitely uh, Hatsu Hiyoki here. Now, Reed, do the numbers back us up? Yeah, the numbers do back you up. And that reach differential is, if I believe what I'm seeing on paper, a nine inch differential. It is enormous, especially in the smaller weight classes. You normally do not see anything like that. So a huge size advantage to Hiyoki and his Striking, his striking stats do come across a little bit more crisp in terms of accuracy. When you're looking at a big reach differential, an important number is the power share. You know, does a guy use a lot of jabs or does he swing for the fences? And Hayoki uses a lot of jabs, and that's actually a good thing when he's trying to use his reach uh, because normally he hasn't really kept pace with his opponents, and that makes him susceptible to using losing rounds. But in this case, I think it really helps. If he snaps that jab, he's going to own the stand-up with that kind of a range advantage. Uh, Menjivar is, is absolutely going to have to bull rush him to get anywhere. And then, of course, as you said, there's some – probably some slight advantages to Hioki even if he does get it to the ground. So uh, I'm agreeing with you. I don't really see anything super dangerous on Menjivar's side of the column here statistically. So I have no reason to think that he, he can pull off a big upset like that. All right, excellent. Now, moving on, we have a fight that was recently bumped up to the main card with a Bantamweight contest featuring a pair of fighters in need of a win as Nam Fan comes in with an 18-13 and 13 record, taking on Vaughn Lee, who is 13-9-1. Now, Nick, where'd you open this fight, and how has public shifted things already? My opening line, minus 170 for Nam Fan, the comeback on Lee, plus 130. It's staying basically steady at minus 165 right now at five times. So a very competitive fight. Um, it should be a great fight at 135. Nam Fan's second trip down there um, in the UFC. So, you know, he was definitely respectable against Mizugaki um, in his debut, I guess, at 135. He did get torched. Though. He got lit up a little bit on the feet there by Mizugaki. His strike defense was exposed uh, more so than normal, I think, with Fan in that fight. But he still had the heart to hang in there, took some shots, and he just tro- really showed what kind of warrior he is. I mean, the guy pushes forward and made things interesting, definitely, especially as the fight went. Um, now, that being said, he's going to have another tough fight here with Lee. I mean, Von Lee has been nothing but impressive to me. If you look back at his early career, in the UK scene and some of the early matches he had, he wasn't 
very talented. I mean, you can see some potential, but he's really put in the work and improved his game overall. He's got underrated wrestling, and he's got decent striking to go along with it. So this is going to be a barn burner, like I said, at 135. I'm going to favor fans slightly here. Um, that's why, obviously, the odds are like they are right now, too. I think it's pretty accurate. He should be a slight favorite. Lee's best chance to win this fight is probably – getting Fan on his back and trying to control or even submit him. Fan is very hard to submit. Obviously, he's never been subbed before. And he's actually kind of hard to take down. I mean, he's got decent takedown defense, um, and he's hard to hold down once you do get him there. Now, that being said, against good grapplers, very solid elite-level grapplers, they do have a tendency to have their way with Fan. Now, Lee is almost at that level. That's what makes this fight so interesting. I think Lee's takedowns and his grappling can definitely pose some problems for Fan, but Overall, you still have to think that Fan is going to probably be able to sprawl and brawl enough. And again, he has enough of a reach, I think, on the feet. He's got, I believe, four inches of pure reach. Um, and that should help him a little bit because the striking advantage definitely goes to, to Fan. I know, again, Lee has some power, a little bit of an unorthodox striking. He mixes things up well, but Fan should still be the superior striker of the two there. So I'm expecting competitive back and forth fight. Fan definitely has to keep this fight upright and still will probably squeak by in this spot. But Nam Fan, I think, is just a little bit better at this point, even though Lee's improvement's been impressive. So I'm going to pick Fan to win this fight. Yeah, and I, I agree in, for the most part. You know, neither of these guys are honestly that exceptional in the UFC. Uh, Fan's 30 years old. Lee's 31. They don't have a whole lot left to prove either. But I think what Fan has going for him is even though he's taken a lot of punishment throughout his career in the UFC, he's extremely durable. Like he just, he's like the Energizer Bunny. You know, he just takes, or I guess it's more like Timex. You know, he takes the licking and keeps on ticking. And basically he, you know, even in the Mitsugaki fight where he got lit up in his Bantamweight debut, he actually came back and won the third round. So the guy just keeps going and going and going and, and he does. He he has a really high output. He pushes forward. He lands good body shots. I mean, he's been known for his body shots since you know his appearance on The Ultimate Fighter when you know he finished Cody McKenzie with him. And he does have pretty solid overall technical boxing. His big problem is sometimes he gets swarmed. He can get overwhelmed. He doesn't have the best striking defense. And his biggest issue, of course, is when he gets taken down. He doesn't do a whole lot defensively. And he can take a lot of damage. Now he's pretty good defensively against submissions. It's, it's against ground and pound that's been his biggest problem. And that is potentially an issue against Vaughn Lee. Lee does probably want to take this fight to the ground because he's a solid Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guy. I mean, he did submit Kid Yamamoto. That's impressive. And I think what was even more impressive was when Vaughn Lee fought Yamamoto, he actually heard him standing before he finished him on the ground. So, uh, he actually does have improving stand-up skills. It's not amazing, but he has decent uppercuts. He's got a little bit of sneaky power, and you know his hooks are pretty sharp. But overall, in terms of if these guys are just standing toe to toe, I got Nam Fan winning a stand-up fight, no problem. So the big question mark here is: Can Von Lee get Nam Fan on his back, and can he do it for at least two rounds? Because I'm not sure he can. Uh, Nam Fan's a relatively big bantamweight physically. He doesn't have long arms, doesn't have a big reach, but uh, I think the physical size should be able to help him out in terms of uh, fending Lee off. So I think Fan outworks Lee with uh, just that crazy pace that he usually pushes and his solid cardio, and uh, I see Fan probably winning a decision here. Now, Reed, uh, what do the numbers tell us? Well, you're right. On the feet, Nam Fan definitely has some advantages. His pace is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, I'm looking, first of all, we've got 150 minutes of octagon time for Nam Fan. It's, it's kind of weird to think about him as such a veteran of the UFC, but there's tons of data. And while standing, he has put on a blistering pace. It is uh, way above anybody on this card and probably above most people on most cards. Um, so he puts on a high pace. He just gets involved in these barn burners, as you said, and his accuracy is actually pretty good. So even at such a high pace, he is landing good strikes. Um, he's not getting hit as often as he's landing, so that's a good thing for him. And one thing that Lee has not been good at is uh, landing his power hand. Um, it has power. He has scored a knockdown. He just doesn't land it very often. And given that he's going to be outpaced on the feet, that's a bad combination. 
especially you throw in a four inch reach differential for fan. A lot of those things all stack up towards favoring fan on the feet. Now on the ground, uh, who is more likely to attempt a takedown? Well, in all of those 150 minutes, Nam Fan only has six takedown attempts, uh, which is barely worth mentioning. Uh, there's only a 10% chance uh, that he, he goes for a, a takedown, actually much less than that per minute. Uh, now, on the other side of the cage, Von Lee has been a little bit more active, not a lot, but a little, uh, and yet both guys have basically spent the majority of their time on the ground on their back or being controlled by someone else. So neither one of them has done very well on the ground, although I will note that there's a lot of submission attempts for for Lee, just in a relative sense. Uh, so the grappling battle is kind of a toss-up. It's who's to say who's really going to have the advantage. Statistically, Lee does have some advantages. He's a little bit more aggressive. He's more likely to go for the takedown. He's got a little bit better defense, better success rate. Uh, so there are some reasons to think that maybe he hustles this on the ground. Uh, I just, I, I think Fan will probably be able to keep this standing, and I think if he does, he edges out the decision. All right, excellent. Now, moving on, we have a heavyweight contest featuring Matt Mitrione, who is six and three overall, taking on Sean Jordan, who is fifteen and five. Now, Nick, where'd you open this one, and how's the public shifted things so far? Near pick them, actually. Mitrione minus 140, the comeback on Jordan, even money. Um, so slight lean towards Mitrione, and immediately um, the overall betting action came in on Jordan, and it flipped the line. Jordan right now is actually at five dimes, minus 165, the comeback on Mitrione, plus 125. I'm expecting that to probably come back down a little bit as the lines tighten up. Again, these are fairly new lines. So it would be close to a pick em with a slight lean towards Jordan, I think, around closing time or so. You know, it's a tricky fight, and of course, right away, getting into this fight, um, I knew it was going to be near Pickham, um, and what you basically have here is Jordan's ground game versus Mitrione's striking game. I know Jordan has been pretty impressive as of late on the feet as well. I mean, coming off that knockout loss to Gonzaga, you can't really say that was impressive, but before that, I mean, he's definitely showed some progress in the striking game, um, has some great power on the feet with his hands. He's got decent boxing. Um, and what makes it interesting here is both these guys are south poles. So I think they're going to match up a little bit different maybe than they're used to, obviously. I mean, fighting orthodox fighters more times than not. So that just a little side note there that makes things interesting. Usually you don't see – very often you don't see two south poles going at it here. Um, but that being said, I think Jordan's best attribute on the feet is that sneaky uppercut he has. He's got so much power with it. I mean, he's landed it several times. He's done a lot of damage with it. That's how he's been really effective with the striking game. But that being said, he's going to probably try to utilize his wrestling and his ground advantage in this spot. Mitrione obviously coming off that um, sub loss to the hands of uh, Brendan Schaub in his last fight. So I think a lot of people are going to kind of, you know, be a little bit hard on Mitrione. I think they're going to think that um, his ground game is probably worse off than it actually is. That was a sneaky sub that Shab caught in Mitrione, on Mitrione in that, during that fight. So I think that Mitrione's ground game is probably a little bit better than everybody thinks. I can continue to see the progress in his overall game. Um, he's definitely putting in work. Um, he's training with uh, the Black Zillions down in Florida. And I think that's actually helped him improve his game that much more. On the feet... I think Mitrione has a decent advantage here. I know that, again, Jordan has had some success as of late, but Mitrione overall, I think he's got a, a better striking attack, better arsenal that he can throw at him. Um, again, he is a southpaw as well. He moves great for a heavyweight, so that's the first thing you got to notice. I mean, both these guys are very athletic, being, um, I mean, former athletes, of course, but or I should say former, but former football players, to be more exact. Um but Mitrione is a little bit faster. I think he's got a little bit more athleticism, and he mixes everything up a little bit better on the feet. He can be more effective. Jordan, his defense is what concerns me a lot. I mean, Mitrione, I think, is going to probably end up landing on Jordan at some point and putting him out. So Jordan definitely needs to get this fight to the floor and try to utilize his ground and pound, his ground game, his control, maybe even look for a Kimura type of sub here to have some success. I wouldn't necessarily recommend him standing up and uh, you know exchanging with Mitrione and coming off of a knockout loss like he just did I don't think that's going to be the case so I'm expecting to see Jordan come in here again looking to take the fight to the floor Mitrione is going to continue to sprawl and brawl um, and then utilize the striking I think what we're going to probably end up seeing is Mitrione be successful really I know he's been put on his back before but even looking again at the progress of his overall ground game at his takedown defense at his athleticism going back to that shop fight 
Schaub was able to get the fight to the floor because he rushed Mitrion with punches, ended up getting inside, grabbed him, and then took him down that way. I don't think Jordan's going to have that kind of success or going to be able to do that sort of thing to him. So I think he's going to struggle getting the takedowns. And, again, I think Mitrion's going to have a little bit more success on the feet. So I'm going to lean with Mitrion. I think my opening line was a little bit better than what's out there right now. Um, so I'm going to go that way. Mitrion is probably going to get the KO. I think he's a little bit more impressive, and he has a bigger upside. Even though he's getting a little bit older, he's 35 years old, I still think he can win more fights in the heavyweight division. Yeah, and I agree on Mitrione. You know, even though he is 35, he doesn't have that wear and tear that a lot of fighters at 35 years old would have. And both these guys are extremely athletic. I mean, Mitrione and Jordan were both former football players. Mitrione actually, you know, was in the NFL briefly. But uh, in terms of MMA talent, I think while Jordan has a slight, slight edge in terms of well-roundedness, I think you know, on the feet where Mitrion does like to keep it, he has, he's dangerous with his hands. He's a solid athletic striker. He's, you know, he can bounce around if he wants. He, he throws kicks relatively well, but obviously uh, his big danger is the right hand. If he lands that, most people are in a lot of trouble. I mean, you saw what happened with uh, Phil DeFries in his last win where he finished it in about 30 seconds. So Mitrion is dangerous and powerful. And the big problem with Jordan is, he doesn't have the very good striking defense as, you know, athletic and quick and explosive as he is capable of being. He is very susceptible to counters. He doesn't defend strikes that well. He's been hit and hurt multiple times. And I think he's a little chinny. So, you know, obviously that doesn't always work. I mean, Brandon Schaub is just as chinny as anybody and, uh, he was able to, to get Mitrione down. So I, he does have that going for him, but. I don't think Sean Jordan is nearly as good on the ground as Brandon Schaub is. Uh, Jordan doesn't really go for chokes. He doesn't have a long reach. He's he's not that great in terms of the measurables. And I think that that's what Mitrione has going for him. He's, he's longer. He's a little taller. He's a southpaw. So, you know, if this fight stays standing, and I think it, is, it will, because I honestly don't think Jordan is that great at taking fights to the ground then I think Mitrione is probably just going to outwork him overall. Uh, Jordan does have, you know, a little good, some good explosion. He can get inside. He can swarm people. He has a good uppercut. But if Mitrione is able to use his reach effectively, then I just see Mitrione either outpointing him or potentially finishing him, especially if Jordan comes in way too aggressively and gets caught with the counter, just like he did in his last fight against Gabriel Gonzaga. So uh, my pick is also Matt Mitrione. Now, uh, Reed, what do the numbers tell us? Well, that's an interesting scenario that you paint, and that is uh, Sean Jordan pushing forward and getting clipped with something. Uh, because Matt Mitrione, I mean, first of all, both these guys actually come in with pretty accurate hands. Um, but the one thing that we note is that Jordan's head strike defense is terrible. Uh, so he has been letting other guys hit him a lot more often than his average. And I don't think you can make that mistake against Mitrione, uh, and especially when Mitrione is going to have that reach advantage. Uh, so that is a potential hole in Jordan's game that could be the difference in this fight. But the ground game is a little murkier. Um, it's not that Sean Jordan has been very aggressive in going to ground, <clears throat> but when he has, he's been pretty successful. His takedown defense is good. <clears throat> his ground control is good. But his offense was basically average. He he doesn't attempt a lot of takedowns, and he has been average. <clears throat> sorry, he's been average in actually landing them. So I I don't know if that's actually going to be the way this plays out. Mitrione uh, has faced guys before where he's he's known they might be coming after him. I think the the, the Schaub fight was a bit more of a surprise to him, although uh, I think Schaub said afterwards that was definitely part of the game plan was to submit him. Um, I don't, I don't know if Sean Jordan can get the fight down there. Uh, if it stays standing, I think Mitrione gets the nod. If it goes down, I think Jordan, uh, has dominated people, at least controlled them. I don't know if he'll finish it there. So it is kind of a toss up. It's where do you think this fight ends up? Uh, and so, um, that will be something, depending on where the lines go, uh, you know, Mitrione certainly has the tools to pull the upset. Now, this takes us to the co-main event of the evening, which is actually the Ultimate Fighter China finale for the welterweight division. We have uh, Wang Sai, who is 7-4 overall, taking on uh, Lepeng Zhang, 
who is seven, seven, and one. So Nick, where'd you open this fight and how's public shift things so far? Yeah, Brian was not mistaking. This is the ultimate fighter finale. China fina- uh, final at welterweight. That's right. So surprisingly, but that's the case. Um, this card is unbelievable, but from top to bottom, I mean, Wow, that's all I can say. But getting into the line, Sai is minus 230, the comeback on Zhang, plus 170. Um, and you know what? I think Sai does definitely have some advantages coming into this fight. He's a more polished striker, no doubt about it. He's got some wrestling to go along with it. Um, again, he's one of these guys that kind of on the feet, patiently waits for his openings, and then unloads with some pretty clean and hard strikes. Um, his boxing can be definitely impressive at times and the cool thing about him is he does mix up some decent techniques i mean he'll throw in um a sneaky elbow um attack once in a while as well and he's pretty good with it i mean he he can't be effective with it um and he's pretty decent in the clinch so i mean i I just i guess i kind of bash these guys and i do see some potential inside no doubt about it with that aspect of it but he has some deficiencies as well i think he's just not that good on the feet he could definitely get picked apart i think if if somebody can um you know keep the fight standing against him he's going to be in a lot of trouble but that might not be the case with zhang um zhang is a pretty athletic guy himself he's strong uh, again uh, basically a 500 type of fighter he, he doesn't you know, normally he wouldn't get this opportunity in the ufc and he's almost at the level where he don't really belong in the ufc obviously but you got to give him credit i mean he did what he had to do and maybe the final here his striking, he does like to push forward. I mean, he's not very technical with stuff, but he's improving. I, I have, I mean, even from the, the first couple fights of the show towards, till the semifinals, I mean, you could see some improvement in Zhang's overall game too. Um, he's got pretty fast hands. He likes to flurry with punches. Um, he's got power in his right hand, no doubt about it. And he does throw an uppercut. So on the feet, he's got some things. Um, and his aggression's probably his best attribute on the feet. And again, he's pretty strong to go along with it, but he's more of a grappling based fighter. Now he's been submitted five times in his career, maybe more. I mean, that's what we see here, but that being said, I think he's still kind of savvy on the ground. I mean, he's got a decent IQ overall. Um, you know, he does scramble well and get top position. He does look for subs. He does have decent ground and pound. Um, and he has got good cardio and stamina. So the guy's definitely in decent shape. And he brings it. I mean, that he has a lot of heart. That, that, again, we're, I'm saying that a lot um, in this podcast because more so than not, I mean, that's what these guys are bringing to the table. They, they're just tough. They bring a lot of heart. They want to win, and their desire is what kind of carries them through here. And I think that's the kind of fighter Zhang is. The line over at five dimes right now is actually Psy minus 280. So early support, bet that line up for minus 230 to minus 280 for Psy. He is the more hyped fighter. He's the more popular fighter, and he is the better fighter. So I am going to lean Psy in this spot, but I'm expecting, like most Ultimate Fighter competitions, usually we see a pretty competitive matchup in the final, and the dogs might be live in most cases as well. I mean, we've seen dogs hit several times throughout the past, and this could be another case. I mean, a lot of people are thinking it's a shoe in for Psy. I don't know. I think Zhang's going to show up be a little bit better than we're all, you know, what we've seen on tape. And he's going to hang in there, and his will to win is going to make things interesting. So size is the better fighter, but again, it's another spot that could be dog or pass with the line being close to three to one because both these guys are just not that good to lay that kind of juice on. So I'm going to pick Sai here, but it's another spot where hopefully Zhang is competitive and uh, does well. And, and I have to agree that Sai is the better fighter, but honestly, neither of these guys are that good. I mean, they did stand out on the show, but I mean, that, that's not saying much because the, the rest of the talent on the show was so weak. But, uh, looking at Sai, I think, I think Nick, you're discount giving him a little too little credit on the feet. I think he's better than that. Uh, he's got relatively good hands, relatively good hand speed. He's aggressive. He's not afraid to brawl. And uh, he he can be a little swarming, and he has relatively good knees. So uh, I think on the feet, he definitely should have an advantage here over LePeng. LePeng is almost nothing on the feet other than trying to initiate a clinch and work for takedowns, get it to the ground, uh, win scrambles, and, and take over the fight that way. But I think Sai, uh, on the feet, he should be much better, and... Uh, he's more powerful, and the the one thing that scares me, though, with Sai in terms of uh, his aggression is sometimes he goes a little too hard, and that leaves an opportunity to fade because uh, LePeng, 
he can he has pretty good cardio. He came back strong in both of his fights to to win solidly in the second round, I believe. And that's something that could happen here against Sai if Sai fades. So got to watch out for that. Sai, you know, he's not lost on the ground. He's actually a pretty solid ground fighter. Uh, when he hurt his hand on the show, he actually was forced to initiate takedowns and work to the ground game to win the, his fight, and he did, and he got a rear naked choke. So uh, Sai is a, much more well-rounded, in my opinion, and he actually trains with some decent fighters. He actually trains with uh, Mike Swick in Thailand. So hopefully that's helping to, to round out his game and properly prepare him for this. Uh, LePang does have the youth advantage. He's only 23, so he could get better. But overall, with Zhang, I, I just don't think he's that good. He's got mediocre to below average takedown defense. Um, he can be pushed around and controlled in fights. And I don't know. It's, it's just, it's a little scary to me. Uh, he's okay in the clinch. He definitely prefers the ground. And while he does have decent submissions, uh, I'm not sure if he'll be able to get there against Sai. Although he does a, he does win scrambles usually, so at least that's from what I've seen. And uh, LePang does have some experience. He's been training for about four or five years now, so he's got that going for him. But I just I just don't think he's good enough unless Sai fades. Uh, Wang uh, LePang and LePang Zhang does not really have a good chance here. So my pick is Wang Sai. And uh, I guess he's going to be your ultimate fighter winner for China. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening, we have a welterweight contest featuring two of the better welterweights in the UFC with Dong Hyun Kim, who is 18-2-1 with one no contest overall, taking on John Hathaway, who is 17-1. Now, Nick, where'd you open this one, and how's the public shifted things? Kim opens as a favorite, minus 280, the comeback on Hathaway, plus 200, and the betting public actually shifted it up right now at 5 dimeseu It's Kim minus 350, the comeback on Hathaway, around plus 290. So early support and steady support coming in on Kim. I think the line's creeping up there a little bit too high. I'm expecting really a competitive bout, but I do understand why everybody's kind of leaning towards Kim because it's really the grappling aspect of the game. Both these guys are more well-known for their grappling, but Kim does have a little bit of advantage when it comes to overall takedown defense and top position and control. Um, and that's probably what's going to win him the fight here. So I am going to slightly lean, I'll say it right away, um, with Kim in this fight. But I do expect Hathaway to show up here and be competitive, especially if it stays up on the feet for any length of time. Because I think um, both these guys are not lost on the feet either. I mean, they're decent strikers. I um, mean, both of them are very similar fighters, in my opinion. They're both kind of long, lanky um, type of fighters. They utilize their kicks well, some knees, some hand attack. Their boxing is okay. So they have a nice mixed blend of uh, strikes to go along with their reach. Um, but the, as far as how they match up here, again, it's – Kind of similar, but I mean, I believe I think Kim has like a 76 inch reach and Hathaway is like 75 and a half. So, I mean, across the board, I see a lot of similarities between these two. But ultimately, I do think that Kim is probably going to end up getting top position more often than not. I mean, it's his takedown ratio is very good and his top position, his grappling overall, he's got good ground and pound. And the bad thing for Hathaway, I mean, if you look back at some of the spots where he struggled in the past, I mean, he had a very close decision against McRae. He won that fight, but it was by split decision um, because of the grappling aspect back and forth. Mike Pyle, to me, uh, back, I think it was in 2010 or so, that was a shocking loss. I mean, it's been a few years, obviously, but, I mean, coming off of the momentum that Hathaway had at that time and losing and getting dominated in, I think, one of Hathaway's best attributes in the grappling realm by a guy like Mike Pyle was very surprising to me. Um, so Kim is a better grappler than obviously a Mike Pyle or even a Chris McRae, I think, as far as actual pure takedown ability control, a grinding type of style. So this is where it's a little bit problematic for Hathaway here. So I think most people are thinking that Kim is going to get the fight and control it uh, more times than not and basically kind of cruise to a competitive uh, hard-fought decision. And I agree with that. I do think that Kim's going to win. Um, but – at the current price, as far as betting goes, I, you can't really recommend a play on Kim. I mean, I think a five-round fight, it is a main event fight. There's a lot of question marks. And in Kim's last fight, even though it was a huge win over Eric Silva, he was starting to fade in that fight. I mean, it was a grueling fight while it lasted. Um, but he was almost on the way out himself before he landed that shot with uh, Silva there. So, 
There's some question marks to me. I'm not really that sold on uh, Kim yet. But in this matchup, he should have the slight edge as far as, again, control, getting the fight to the floor, and utilizing what he does best. So my pick is going to be Kim, but honestly, it's not a very confident pick. Yeah, and while I do think that Kim has a, a huge advantage in terms of the grappling, even though John Hathaway is a solid grappler, you know, he's one of those guys that has been trained in MMA since he started, and you know, he didn't start in one single discipline. The the thing that really does scare me here is that Mike Pyle fight. I know it was three years ago, but you know, honestly, Hathaway hasn't had a whole lot of opportunities to really showcase his talent since then because he is so injury prone. I mean, I know he's only 26 right now, but, you know, at one point he was being hailed as, you know, the next great, uh, prospect out of the UK. There was a lot of hype behind him and he really stopped living up to it after that big Diego Sanchez win. You know, he had the pile loss that the Chris McRae fight honestly could have easily gone to Chris McRae. Uh, he ended up, uh, Hathaway ended up winning a split decision. And while Hathaway looked really good in his, fight against Pascal Krauss, you know, he wasn't even that great against John McGuire. So I, I'm definitely concerned that Dong Hyung Kim is going to be able to take him down and at worst, uh, just get on top of him and smother him. But I think what Hathaway has going for him here is he should be better on the feet. He's a little more active. He uses his reach well. Um, he, he's a little hittable, but I think he he pushes a decent enough pace to to make up for that. And Dong Hyun Kim honestly is even though he got that big knockout over Eric Silva, he's not that good of a striker. That was more of a Hill Mary just completely caught Silva napping type of thing. So I really don't expect him to pull that type of trick off again. But uh Hathaway, I think his best attribute might be his knee. Uh, he rocked Pascal Krauss with it. He almost knocked out Diego Sanchez with it. And if Dion Kim Kim isn't careful he, diving in for a takedown, he could get clipped as well. And I think, uh, you know, there is potential for an upset because especially this being a five round fight. I mean, Dion Kim Kim was sucking wind at the midway point of the second round against Eric Silva. If Hathaway pushes a pace like that or even close to that, he could eventually take over, even if he is smothered for a couple rounds. So uh, the big concern, though, obviously, Dong Hyun Kim is a stifling, stifling uh, wrestler. When he gets people down, he usually keeps them there multiple times throughout his career. He has just absolutely smothered opponents. And I think that Hathaway is susceptible to that. So I'm going to lean uh, Kim but it's not crazy confident. It's not a slam dunk, and I definitely won't be betting Kim. But, uh, yeah, I, I am picking Kim to at least probably win about three rounds, maybe more, uh, with the wrestling. So what do the numbers tell us for this one, Reed? Well, they agree with you. It's it's a lot closer on paper than it seems to be in the market. Um, standing up, John Hathaway actually looks pretty good. He's got a number of advantages. He's the more accurate power striker. But he, more importantly, he has a very, very high pace. Uh, he not only just a raw pace standing, he, he maintains this very quick output, but he's used to outworking his opponents, whereas Kim is the reverse. He has a slow pace overall, and he's used to being outworked. Um, so that tells me that standing, Hathaway could be winning rounds. Uh, the power leans towards Kim. Uh, he's been a little bit higher in his knockdown rate, but probably not the difference maker in this matchup. They're similarly sized. Kim has a southpaw advantage. It's it's back and forth, but I still think it's very close, if not leaning towards Hathaway while standing. It's the ground stats that have been surprising. Um, I know Hathaway does have some good credentials in terms of grappling, but it's Kim who has far and away really outperformed on the ground. He's been in dominant control on the ground. He has excellent takedown defense, um, really excellent. I mean, he's he's way up there probably within the ranks. Uh, his offense, they, they actually have almost identical rates of takedown offense and success rate. So that's kind of a toss-up, but I don't think that Hathaway is going to get top control. I think if anything, it's going to be Kim that ends up on top. And if he does, he can definitely control on the ground, um, stay busy, and win rounds there. So it, it is kind of a back-and-forth toss-up here. Um, I, I'm a little surprised by the line. Uh, so if it does 
I, I don't see a lot of evidence that it could end early. So again, I might be the best bet might might be looking for some points or um, maybe a closer decision that that people are predicting. So uh, yeah, I I can't. I can't throw in all my chips on a heavy favorite here the way this is because Hathaway does really look good on paper. Uh, one thing I will throw in there, he's had over a year layoff, and that is normally a bad sign. Um, ring rust, I talk about it in my book. Those guys coming back from a year-long layoff only win about one-third of their fights, although you know, that's about where the betting line is right now. So um, that macro trend, I, I'm not sure. It depends on the nature of his injuries. He's still a young guy, so I think it'll have less an effect, but pretty close on paper. Thanks, Reed. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for the Ultimate Fighter China finale, part two of the Premium Oddscast featuring our premium bets for the show, as well as potentially some plays on the Bellator and Titan FC 27 event will be out Friday afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So stay tuned for that if you're an MMA Odds Breaker premium member. With the three events taking place this weekend, we'll likely have a free play to give out, so make sure to follow at Premium Oddscast on Twitter, because that's where we'll post the free bet first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsBreaker.com, and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Also, feel free to like our Premium Oddscast Facebook page. We post articles, show announcements, videos, and plenty of other information there so you can stay up to date on everything that has to do with us if you're interested. Last but not least, I have to plug fellow co-host Reed Kuhn's book, Fightnomics, which discusses the numbers and statistics and budding trends behind mixed martial arts. You can purchase his book digitally or via paperback at Amazon.com. Special thanks to our sponsor, Five Dimes. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on our side this weekend.